Hello and welcome. You're watching NDTV. I'm Rishika Badwa. India has reported the lowest daily deaths in over six months. India's cases continue to dip, but there is a fear of a new UK strain uh, that is believed to be spreading rapidly across the world. To make sense of our fight against the coronavirus, Dr. Randeep Guleria, the director of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences and co-author of uh, Till We Win India's Fight Against the COVID-19 Pandemic, joins us. Thanks, Dr. Guleria, for sparing the time Thank of day you. and being with us. I want to begin by asking you about uh, the cases continuing to decline in India and contrasting this with, uh, you know, the rise that we are seeing uh, in terms of the global cases. What explains this trend? What is it that India seems to be doing right, according to you? So currently, as we look at things, it seems to be that uh, in India, things are uh, we are in a much better position, uh, both in terms of the number of cases, our recovery rate and our mortality. Uh, there could be a number of factors. One, of course, is that we've been very aggressive in promoting COVID-appropriate behavior. Even there have been fines uh, being put forward for people uh, who are not wearing masks. Also, I think we are a younger population. We probably uh, get less severe illness and therefore uh, are not manifesting as uh, much as uh, the Western world is. And I think it's also the weather because now it's much more colder in uh, Europe and US and the viruses are known to transmit themselves much more, survive in the environment much more if it's a very cold environment and people are huddled in, inside. Mm -hmm. Also in Europe and US, like we saw during uh, the Diwali time, it's the festive season. It's pre-Christmas and Christmas and New Year is celebrated much more uh, aggressively there. We had Thanksgiving also. All of this leads to uh, people mixing, crowding, uh, and that has led to a surge in cases uh, in um, Europe, yeah. UK, and in the United States. Right. It's interesting that you talk about how it's much colder in the countries that we're, we're talking about. But despite, uh, you know, a very severe winter in several parts of North India, we've managed to contain the numbers. Correct. So in North India, we still have, we have multiple factors which could be aggravating. One of them, of course, is the weather. The, the other factor, of course, is high levels of air pollution in the Indo-Gangetic belt. But still, despite that, I think we have, we've been able to be aggressive in containment in terms of uh, testing, tracking, and right. treating. And that has really helped uh, us. And we've been able to maintain the downward trend in a sustainable ma manner now for many weeks. Right. Also, in terms of uh, daily COVID deaths, India has recorded uh, you know, its lowest daily deaths in six months. This has, of course, prompted many to ask, Dr. Guleria, can we go so far as to say that the worst is now over? So I think, yes, we could say that the worst is over because we have, has, have a sustainable decline. But like we've seen with the mutation, this is a virus which we have to be very wary about. And we don't know how it will evolve over the next few weeks. Yes. Therefore, I think till we have a vaccine and we are comfortable that a sufficient number of people have been vaccinated, we will still have to be very, very cautious. But I think we can say that we can have a little bit of uh, cautious optimism, if I may put it that way. Okay. So we can be cautious, optimistic, which, which sort of prompts me to my next question. You know, last week uh, during the show, you said that, you know, one can perhaps say that India is past the peak. Uh, are we heading towards herd immunity or are we heading towards a post-infection phase as many experts now believe we are? So it's likely, but I think we need more data and therefore I think it's uh, uh, what is being planned also is to do a zero surveillance to look yes. at what is the degree of uh, antibodies in the community. And uh, we need to get that data so that we are able to see two things. One is what is the degree of uh, protection that we have and therefore, what will be the amount of vaccination that may be needed to really provide that sufficient mass of people hmm. who have uh, antibodies either through the vaccination or through uh, the infection and thereby can break the chain of transmission and that can dramatically bring down the number of cases in our country. So you are saying that it's possible if we do a zero survey in India today, we actually realize that a lot of people have developed antibodies which would explain our dipping numbers? I think so, because we there are certain, uh, let's say, indirect signals which suggest that there may be some sort of herd immunity developing in various right. parts of the country. Uh, the example is of various states uh, which have had elections, which have had a lot of crowding and people uh, not wearing right. masks and getting together. We haven't seen a huge spike in the number of cases there. 
whether it be from the testing point of view, whether it be hospital admissions or mortality. Mm. So that means there is something else which is causing them to be protected. And that could be uh, already uh, having had an exposure and antibodies being present in them. Right, very interesting. Uh, you know, the other big development, of course, uh, that, that's gripped the news all over the world is, is the new coronavirus uh, mutation. Now, you know, for the benefit of our viewers, Dr. Guleria, could you break it down? What is, most simply put, a virus mutation? So we must understand that a virus is basically has RNA strand and then it has an envelope and it, the, the coronavirus has what we call spike proteins and projections outside. Hmm. Now viruses are known to mutate because that is how they evolve. When viruses replicate and they replicate inside the host cell, remember a virus needs a cell to replicate and become uh, and uh, sort of uh, uh, propagate itself. Right. When it does that, when it starts replicating, sometime when the replicating uh, viruses are formed, they may not be totally identical to the original one which entered the cell. Right. And that sometime leads to mutation. Some viruses mutate much more uh, frequently, as is the influenza virus. Mm -hmm. The coronavirus tends to mut mutate much more slowly, but it does mutate. And this is a natural process. So as we've gone through the pandemic, we've, there has been multiple reports of mutations being picked up. And also that the original virus, which was which started the pandemic, let's say from Wuhan, hmm. has mutated and it's probably changed dramatically from what it was when it started the pandemic. Right. Now, when we look at a mutation, one is it's a scientific curiosity. We find it's a mutation, but it hasn't really made any difference to us from a clinical point of view. Mm -hmm. Our concern when, when we look at a mutation are basically from four points of view. One is, is this mutation going to lead to a more infectiousness? Is the virus now going to spread more rapidly? Secondly, is it going to lead to more sick patients and therefore more hospitalization? Thirdly, is it going to lead to more mortality? Is this now a more virulent stain and your case fatality rate will go up dramatically? It causes severe pneumonia. It causes your lungs to really get badly damaged. Yes. And finally, we want to find out, does it, is it going to really change our vaccine strategy? Okay. I think all of those are questions uh, that I am going to put, uh, put forth. Okay. But does India have multiple strains of the coronavirus as well at the moment? So if, if you look at the surveillance data, and this needs genome, genome sequencing, it does suggest that we've also seen mutations in our country, but none of them have had a lot of significance. They've been predominantly scientific uh, observations and scientific reporting. But I think it's what the uh, mutation and the data from uh, the United Kingdom has shown us, that we have to be very vigilant and we have to start looking at our own data very, very closely from the point of view of mutation and its clinical epidemiological implication. Does this mutation, is this mutation only a scientific curiosity? Hmm. Or does it have uh, implication for its clinical manifestation, right. for the diagnosed, from the diagnostic kit's point of view, from its uh, fertility? And will it really need uh, for us to change or modify the vaccine that we're making? Okay. We need to now start doing that in an aggressive manner because we've got our cases down now. Yes. We really fought that battle and come out of it. And now when we have just the, the last part left, we don't want that to get disturbed. And therefore, all of this needs to be done aggressively so that now we are, our decline right. continues and we continue to have a good uh, decrease in number of cases. Well, very interesting. Uh, you, you, you mentioned gene sequencing. What is gene sequencing? If you could you know, simplify it for our viewers. So when we look at uh, 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 testing, when we do the RT-PCR testing, we're just looking at whether we are looking at some specific part of the gene which will tell us that this is the coronavirus and this is COVID-19. We are not looking at the entire uh, gene to see where, where are there some changes in the uh, sequence of uh, proteins there mm -hmm. to tell us that this says there is a change from what it was originally. Right. Now, so this is a more sophisticated test. It's done in uh, lesser labs and it, it's, it, it, uh, from the cost point of view, it's uh, relatively a little bit more costly. So what are, it is done in most countries, and this is what India is now doing, is uh, what we had already started, but we're now building on that, is to develop a consortium of network of labs which can do gene sequencing and you pick up a certain percentage of samples. So you can do two things. One is do random sampling from all areas and you pick up and see what is the change in the gene? Has the virus mutated and is it of significance or not? Right. Secondly, 
look at areas where there is some sort of a red flag you're suddenly finding an area where you're having higher mortality yes or you're finding that there's a spurt in the number of cases right so those are red flags which mean maybe the virus in this area has mutated so besides doing all the uh, the uh, epidemiological work with, that mm. we do in terms of containment in terms of uh, um house to house testing hmm. we should also take samples and sequence them to see has this virus changed from what we are seeing in other parts of the country and therefore develop develop an action plan accordingly all right uh, the uk virus mutation and let's just talk about that uh, uh, specifically has been detected according to the world health organization now in eight european countries how can we prevent it from spreading in india so i think the issue here is first is looking at Uh, individuals who are coming from outside and testing them especially those who are positive yes having a very strong surveillance and at the same time looking out for any red flags like i mentioned which suggest that there is a, a a different behavior from what we've been seeing over the last few weeks right we're seeing a downward trend if that continues we need not worry mm-hmm. but if we suddenly find that there's a spurt in the number of cases then we really need to start doing the testing as a matter of fact that is how this uh, variant and its effect was picked up in the uk right the mutation was actually noticed on 20th of september it was reported on 20th of september but it was felt that this is like any other mutation that they have been seeing right but then when they started looking at the surge in the number of cases hmm. in southeast uh, england and in london and in the kent area and they started comparing it with the mutation they found a strong correlation that wherever this mutation was being seen hmm. there were there was a spike in the number of cases although it was not being s- reflected in number of hospital admissions or mortality so the conclusion that they drew was that wherever you finding this mutation you're seeing more cases right and based on modeling data then it was uh, concluded that your r not that is how much it spreads hmm. was had gone up by 0.4 and therefore they, this strain was 70% more infectious so this is the type of surveillance that we now need to develop right as we reach a stage where the number of cases has come down significantly you know you you talk about increased surveillance but the other question of course is are symptoms any different can people themselves be watchful of something different uh, which which corresponds to a mutated strain so i think the concern that individuals have is are are, are symptoms different is it a more serious strain is it going to lead to more yes. hospitalization is it going to lead to more deaths whatever data we have and there is a lot of data now emerging from uk and from other countries where the strain is being reported does not suggest that the symptoms are any in any way different okay. it's still a covid-19 virus the virus behaves in a similar manner it is not causing increased hospitalization nor is it causing increased deaths so i think we need to be reassured that from that point of view it's not going to lead to a huge spurt in our case fatality rate but having said that we have to be very cautious and continue to observe and do the surveillance right because this virus will mutate again so we have picked up this right. mutation a month or two down the line it will again mutate so we have to be as smart as the virus because we need to be able to uh, stop it in its track rather than allowing it to spread and then sort of start doing things right you know uh, s- sticking to this uk strain uh, and and i know you have clarified that it spreads more rapidly but not necessarily more deadly but it's spreading even among younger adults which wasn't the case with the strain that we're seeing in india for instance will it therefore cause more deaths and hospitalization especially talking about younger adults so again this is an observation which was seen in uh, in uk that this was be- these cases was being seen more in the younger age group mm-hmm. Uh, and but there could be multiple other factors which could explain this in terms of the younger age group going out much more mixing with, uh, with each other much, right. much more especially during the holiday season going shopping uh, going to pubs or uh, uh, bars and therefore it's possible that this observation may be related to other factors rather than the virus itself mm-hmm. but we need more data before we can say that right. but even in the younger age group it's not been shown to be linked with higher mortality as of now okay the million dollar question will the coronavirus vaccine be effective against different mutations of the virus you yourself have said you know we need to be more vigilant the virus can mutate in a matter of weeks so will the vaccine therefore be effective to these different mutations so i think we have multiple vaccines and they are using different platforms mm-hmm. secondly vaccines try and induce 
uh, neutralizing antibodies by acting at different sites or multiple sites in the spike protein on the, on the level of the spike protein. And they also induce what we call a T cell immunity uh, in the human body. Therefore, it's quite uh, very unlikely that vaccines will be ineffective. Right. The vaccine will still work despite the mutations that are happening. However, we need to see, will this affect the efficacy of the vaccine? I think we need more data for that. Mm -hmm. And we also need to have a plan in place in case there is a major mutation which may lead to significant decline in vaccine efficacy. How can we change the vaccine which can be done right. so that it covers for the mutant strain also? But will, you know, as experts have suggested, vaccines need to be tweaked to respond to future mutations. Is that even a possibility, scientifically speaking? Yes, that may happen. That happens with influenza itself. We okay. take an annual flu shot for influenza. And that the reason why we take an annual shot is that every year the virus goes, undergoes what we call an antigenic drift. Right. It changes itself. And therefore, the, the efficacy of the vaccine, which was available the year before, becomes less. And therefore, a new vaccine has to be given, which is uh, effective against this current circulating strain. So as the, if the strain changes very much as far as COVID-19 is concerned, it mutates significantly, we may have to tweak the vaccine so that it is effective against the current uh, circulating uh, mutant strain. But currently, unlike uh, influenza, the COVID virus and coronavirus does not uh, mutate that much. And therefore, it's likely that we may not have to change the vaccine so frequently as we do with the uh, uh, influenza. Okay. Can a recovered patient, therefore, Dr. Guleria, be reinfected with a different strain of the coronavirus? Is that a possibility? So the first important thing to remember is it's still COVID, it's still a coronavirus, yes. and you will still have immunity. And we even know from the past that even if you have uh, uh, infection with another coronavirus strain, there is some degree of cross immunity. Mm -hmm. So with this strain, when the change is not that much, it's the same strain which has only mutated, you will still continue to have protection as far as you have antibodies and cell mutated immunity in your body. Therefore, if you have had infection in the past, the chance of you getting reinfection with the new a new mutant strain is less. You will have some degree of protection. Okay. Uh, you know, once again, uh, we're hearing of a Boston doctor who's, uh, you know, reportedly had a severe allergic reaction this time to the Moderna vaccine. Once again, pointing... Uh, you know, to questions around safety and efficacy of uh, COVID-19 vaccines. What should we make of these allergic reactions that are being reported? Uh, because, uh, you know, it doesn't inspire confidence. Many say it takes a decade for a vaccine to develop. These vaccines have developed in a matter of 10, 11 months. Are they really safe? So I think it's very important to understand how these vaccines were developed in such a short duration. The first thing is the vaccine platforms which have been used have been, research has been going on for more than five, six years to develop such platform. And they've been used in various, for other various other vaccines, like trying to develop the Ebola vaccine and others. So it's not a new platform, but uh, a lot of things have been compressed because the fact that things have been done in parallel rather than sequence. We would do initial animal studies, then you will do a phase one study, get the data, then do phase two studies, phase three studies, then take the approval from the regulatory authorities. Here, because of a lot of investment which the government has done, which uh, the industry has put in, these phases have been done in parallel. But in no way has safety and efficacy been compromised. Right. Therefore, I think one can be reassured that the vaccines are safe and efficacious. Now that raises, raises two issues. One is, how, what, why are people getting the allergic reaction? So that is basically any vaccine that we give, even which, which have, which have right. gone through 10 years of research, hmm. will have some degree of uh, ingredients which can cause an allergy. Okay. So you will have individuals who will have an allergic reaction to even you have an allergic to a drug. You give it to um, uh, 50,000 people, one or two will develop an allergy to, to a drug also. So that is something that is inherent with any a vaccine or drug that someone will develop allergies and that is why right. you should observe individuals after they, they've been vaccinated for at least some time so as to, to make sure that they don't develop an allergic reaction. The okay. second important issue to understand is that there are there would be some rare side effects which may happen on a long term basis. Right. All of these vaccines we have a good animal data we have data for follow up which may be for two to three months but we don't have a data for follow up for six months one year. 
Mm-hmm. Now, it's very unlikely to have any side effects which will occur after six months to one year of a vaccine, but rarely they can happen. And therefore, even after vaccinating, after you get an emergency use authorization, individuals are followed up very closely for months to see for any rare, hmm. unexpected side effects. So there is right. a lot of robustness in making sure that vaccines are safe and we follow up individuals to take course correction if any side effects happen. Right, I think that's very reassuring information uh, for people to know at, at this time especially. Uh, Dr. Guleria, the other big issue is one of night curfews. Are they really effective in stopping the spread of COVID-19 currently? A lot of conversation around that. So I think the the use of night curfew may not be that useful because it's for a very short duration. You may decrease the chance of people partying or going to pubs or to restaurants mm-hmm. by doing this so that people go home uh, early and therefore are not in the market or in uh, a restaurant for a longer period of time. If that is the intention, you may you will have a decrease in the number of crowds in a, right. in a particular city. But it will not really break the chain of transmission uh, because for that you need to have a more sustained and uh, 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 con- uh, lockdown for a longer period in time. Okay, then what precautions, uh, you know, should be followed during New Year celebrations? We asked you these questions during Diwali as well. Uh, you know, with festival season this entire week, what would you like to tell viewers? So I'd like to tell the viewers that now we are in a much better position. We already have a good decline in the number of cases. The vaccine is just around the corner. And therefore, this is the time where we need to be really careful uh, in terms of COVID-appropriate behavior, especially when we're worried about this uh, new strain. So therefore, may wearing a mask, avoiding crowded places, maintaining physical distancing and hand washing is very, very important. This is not the time when we're celebrating New Year and Christmas that we should have a, a loved one go into hospital or we lose a loved one. And we, that will be really regrettable when we consider that maybe two months down the line, we could have vaccinated someone and he could have been protected. So I think this is the time when we need to be over cautious because we're just, there is now sort of light at the end of the tunnel and we just need to wait for some more time. Well, absolutely. Stay home, stay safe, continues to remain the mantra. I want to, you know, very briefly just talk about the India vaccine timelines as well. The ICMR has said that Covaxin phase one, uh, phase two trial data has been promising. This of course hasn't been peer reviewed just yet. But in the light of this, what is the timeline, Dr. Guleria, that we're looking at for a vaccine in India? So I think we are all looking at the regulatory approval and uh, a lot of data has already been given to them. Uh, Like I said in the beginning, for any vaccine to be uh, given regulatory approval and for it to come into the market, there has to be confidence among the regulators that this is a safe and effective vaccine. So this is what is being done. Uh, I'm confident that probably by early next year, uh, we will get the regulatory approval because the data is already there. One is also now having data from the Serum Institute vaccine because the AstraZeneca vaccine has been, uh, studies have been done in many countries and there is a large body of data available there also, both in terms of safety and efficacy. So I'm I'm pretty confident that by the end of this year or early next year, we should get the regulatory approvals and therefore uh, have the vaccine being rolled out uh, on a priority basis. Well, we've heard you say end of ne- end of this year, beginning of next year, several times over on the show. It's actually now days and weeks away. So uh, the <laughs> countdown in a certain sense has begun. But, you know, the other question that a lot of our viewers have actually asked is, will one vaccine be better than the other, given the fact that the world is going to have multiple coronavirus vaccines uh, to fight this pandemic? So this is a tough question because we don't really have the data. There is no head-to-head comparison between different vaccines. And that's why I keep feeling that maybe six months from now, we will be spoiled for for choice because we will have multiple vaccines which will get the regulatory approval. And I think then we will have to critically look at multiple things. One is which vaccine is better and and which would be useful in different, uh, let's say, categories. We may have a vaccine which is more effective in the elderly as compared to another one. So we could say that this is one which works more in the older age group or for certain other comorbidities. Also, it will depend on the number of doses that are available right. so that we can uh, vaccinate a larger number of people. So I think it's a good thing that we have multiple vaccines. But the next year is going to be very, very interesting in terms of trying to decipher which is the best among all of them and which should we give right. to different 
uh, different groups. All right. So 2021 definitely will usher in hope as far as this pandemic is concerned. Thank you so much, Dr. Guleria, as always, for being so patient, patient and answering all our questions. Thank you. Thank you.